Thank you very Thank much. You, uh, thanks for the introduction. OK, so uh, I will talk about Ghost. I see a diverse audience. So I will, the last half will be more technical about uh, parallelization methods. But I will start with some of the applications we have been doing with Ghost. Well, in, in some cases, we, in some cases, peop, users of Ghost in the last 10 years. Okay, most of the things I will show you are very, very big runs or were big runs at the time that the runs were done. So, um, okay, so first, who is who here in this talk? So, um, most of the development of code was, of Ghost was either done by me or by Dwayne Rosenberg, uh, especially of the main core, the dynamical core, Drag Ready at NOAA was also very instrumental in some of the uh, optimizations in the code. Many of the applications I will show you were done in collaboration with Anik. And then Alexandros Alexakis, Patricio Clark de Leoni, who is a PhD student in Buenos Aires, and Pablo Dimitruk, who is a professor in Buenos Aires, implemented several of the solvers I will show you that today are part of Ghost. So, so Ghost is. A code, it's a, so Ghost stands for geophysical high order suite for turbulence. So it's a pseudo spectral code it, to study turbulence in 2D and 3D boxes. Originally, the idea was to study geophysical turbulence. In the last three or four years, we have added some solvers that go beyond geophysics. But the main design behind Ghost is really. Uh, the idea of studying geophysical turbulence in different approximations and in different domains. So it can solve PDEs by now. It's really a sort of general PDE solver in periodic domains in two and three dimensions. It combines MPI, OpenMP, and CUDA. The user can compile with any combination of those. And, uh, but and it can actually compile with the three. I will show you examples in which we use the three levels of parallelization. And it has a hierarchical parallelization that really starts with MPI. Then it goes into shared memory with OpenMP. And then it uses GPUs as accelerators with CUDA. And the way in which I will talk in the last half of the talk has to do a lot with that hierarchy. It's mostly written in Fortran from 95 to 2008, depending on what we need. And some portions of the codes are in C or in CUDA. And this is really, really important. And it's, it has been behind the development of, Co of Ghost for the last 12 years. The idea is to have a code that can run efficiently in a laptop to a supercomputer. And the reason for that is that some of the users of Ghost like myself, like to be in a meeting and start a discussion with some colleague and go to the hotel at night and check whether things are OK or not. So it must run efficiently in a laptop like this one. Uh, then there are users that have small clusters, can be just one node with multi cores to a few hundred cores in their universities. And Ghost has to be efficient for them. And then there are users that mostly use goals to do hero runs. So it has to do well in supercomputers. And the largest production runs, not benchmarks. Benchmarks I actually have a little bit larger. But production runs, largest we have done, are in 100,000 cores, up to 6,000 6, GPUs, and several tens of millions of hours. So it's uh, of CPU hours. It works very well together with Vapor. Actually, when I started working in a version of Ghost that other people except myself could use, Vapor was also being developed. So uh, the development went together in a lot of things. And uh, so Ghost comes with tools to transfer the data to Vapor easily. And it integrates very well for visualization and data analysis. So why a code for turbulence? Okay, So why have a code for turbulence? So many of you know this, but it's 
good idea to keep this in mind. Turbulence is ubiquitous. It's, it's everywhere, right? It's in the atmosphere, in the ocean, in experiments in the lab, in space physics. And it has a lot of properties that make it special from the point of view of high performance computing. So one is that, so here what you see, you know this picture, this is Jupiter. It's characterized by a huge separation of scales, and it's a multi-scale process, right? So you have large scale structures, small scale eddies. You have all of these things going all over the place. And that imposes very strict requirements on spatial resolution. So if you want to study a well-developed turbulent flow, you need large-scale resolutions. So you need big computers. It has sensitivity to initial data. And that's, that imposes conditions on the methods you use, especially if you want to be conservative. Conserved quantities are very important in turbulent flows. So it requires, in many cases, high-order methods. It also generates spontaneously extreme events. You start with any turbulent flow, you will have very strong gradients. You will have, if you look at the statistics, you will have extreme events. To have well-converged statistics, you need high-order methods. And then it has a lot of interesting properties from the physical point of view that, like we, that we like to study, like mixing, transport. And those things are then useful for large scale model. So GHOST was developed really as a way to study the small scale turbulent processes. So it can solve a huge number of equations. By now, we have over 40 sets of PDEs implemented in GHOST. Each solver is basically just four files, one file with the equations, one file with global output quantities, another file with statistical analysis you may want to do during the run, and then just one consistency check. But basically, by adding four short files, you add a new set of equations. So we have compressible and incompressible Navier-Stokes. We have compressible and incompressible MHD, so conducting fluids for space physics. We have whole MHD and other kinetic plasma effects that are of interest for people doing turbulence in space physics. We can do rotating flows, stratified flows, rotating stratified, of course. We can do transport of passive scalars. We can do quasi-geostrophic and surface quasi-geostrophic. And uh, then, if we skip this, which is where we are departing from the geophysics, we can do recently, from, we added many, many particles. So we can do transport of Lagrangian particles inertial particles, so laden particles, and um, charged particles for space physics. We can do subgrid scale models. And then we have these guys that are a lot of fun for me and for other people. So in recent years, we added some quantum mechanics. So GHOST can do nonlinear Schrodinger equation and can do superfluids and Bose-Einstein condensates. And it can do uh, ginzburg landau equations for reaction diffusion proce process. So a few examples of this. So this is a 2,000 cube run we did in 2008. So it, by, at that time, it was very big run. This is isotropic and homogeneous turbulence. So this is just Navier-Stokes in a cubic box. And that's the entire box. You can recognize, so what you, this is a visualization done with vapor. And what you see, um, so this is the entire box. And what you're seeing is regions with strong vorticity. So the curl of the velocity. And you can actually confirm what I was saying. You have a lot of extreme events, right? So you have regions that are basically black and regions with huge values of the vorticity that are very, very concentrated at small scales. So for this, you need high order. And what you, so this is a zoom into this region. That's a zoom into that region. That's a zoom into this region. So you can see there is a, some self-similarity. But at small scales, we reach, at some point, if we keep doing zooms, we reach a scale in which we have those very thin vortex filaments. And actually, I can show you a zoom into some of those. And you get things like this big, regions with large vorticity, so like big eddies, 
that are actually formed by a myriad of small scale vortices. Uh, yeah. Yes, it's typical of these flows. For isotropic and homogeneous turbulence, it's typical. For Oh, but that's, yeah, but that's only because this is at very, very small scales. So basically, they are aligning with the local shear. Yeah. But uh, this is very, very small scale. So this is like uh, one of these strikes. So it's tiny in the entire domain. So um, we, this is a simulation of rotating turbulence also with GOES. This is a 1536 cube, and we have done a 3,000 cube of rotating turbulence. So in the case, if you add rotation, you get uh, Taylor columns. So, um, so you get these columns that are very, very smooth. And then you may say, OK, then maybe I don't need big resolution. But what you see there is a zoom into this region. And you see that you have this column that is smooth and cyclonic. But outside the column, you have all that mess and a lot of small scale structures. Stably stratified turbulence, you can also do with ghosts. So this is temperature, different levels of stratification. Black is colder than the average. White is hotter. If you do a zoom, and again, these are tiny regions in the domain, you get things like this. So you have the flow moving in one direction, the hot flow moving in one direction, cold moving in the opposite. So you have kelvin Helmholtz instabilities. Or you can have mixing like this. And these are tiny, tiny structures in the flow. So ghost can also do something that people in, and this is recent, people in geophysics like a lot, very thin boxes with just a few levels in the vertical and large resolution in the horizontal. So this is uh, just, this is just st uh, stably stratified turbulence with a large scale circulation. That's a box from the top. This is just, this is the boxing from the side. 256 levels. So it's a lot of levels in the vertical. And then you have a lot of mixing and a lot of things going on, because you are resolving the turbulence even in the vertical. Yes. So uh, in all these cases, uh, it's periodic. I have a few cases that are not, but yeah, in all directions. All the cases I have shown so far are periodic. So um, this is a run that I will come back to it, because it will be useful also from the technical point of view as a benchmark and as an example of speed up using different hardware. So this is a 4,000 cube of rotating and stratified turbulence we did last year. Um, so this is the entire box. This is 4,000 times 4,000, so the resolution of the projector is cannot get it. This is a zoom into that region. And you can actually see, so this is just vertical vorticity in one layer. You can see we have big eddies. We have these fronts with a lot of small scale structures. What is, there are two things that are nice for, uh, about this run, one from the physical point of view, one from the technical point of view. So from the physical point of view, the parameters in this run are realistic for the southern abyssal ocean at mid latitudes. And by realistic, I mean Froude, Rossby. All the non-dimensional numbers are in the ballpark. This box has a few kilometers side. And the dissipation scale is 15 centimeters, which is between 5 to 10 times what it should be. So it's almost a DNS. So from that point of view, it's very, very nice. And the physical quantities you get, like dissipation rates, are very, very close to what people estimate or measure for problems like this. From the technical point of view, this run was done in Titan using 100,000 cores and 6,000 GPUs. So I will come back to this when I talk about speed ups, because this is very big from the point of view of using a lot of cores and a lot of GPUs. Outputs are also very bad. Each output takes two terabytes 
So <laughs> that's a reason to do compression. So, <laughs> so then, OK, we, you can also do conducting fluids. So this is a run we did a long time ago, almost 10 years ago here at Anchor. Um, it's MHD turbulence. And you get a lot of nice structures. And this is something more recent. This is a 2,000 cube. We also have a 4,000 cube, which is right now is the largest simulation in the world of superfluid turbulence. This is, uh, these are runs solving the Schrodinger equation with um, cubic potential, so what people call the gross Pitaevsky. So um, this is, from the point of view of Ghost, it, implementing these kind of things opened the doors to a lot of things, because it's not a fluid solver. You are really solving the, for the complex wave function. So once we added these, there are a lot of problems that can be tackled. And it really became a general PDE solver. So what you see there, this is density. Actually, what you see there is regions of low density. So they are vortex, quantized vortices in the domain. This is like isotropic and homogeneous turbulence, but in quantum mechanics. So, um, so that's the detail. This is the entire box. And if you look in detail, you have, just like I showed you before, fat vortices, which are made up. And this is a tiny zoom into that tene region. They are made up of a tangle of quantized vortices. Yes? <laughs> OK, so that's a good question. So, and it, it's very nice because, so why would people care in sheer physics about this? Uh, so a superfluid has no viscosity. So something that happened in the last 10 years, and that's why we added this solver to the code, is that people have started to do experiments of superfluids and superfluid turbulence in the lab. And that allows them to reach huge Reynolds numbers in small domains. So there are a lot of things that can be learned from these kind of problems about classical turbulence. And that's the motivation to these kind of problems. I haven't answered one second. So there is no viscosity here. So the size, the, the radius of the vortex cores is not given by Kolmogorov or by viscosity. It's given by the physics. So in helium-4, it's like one Armstrong. It's really the size of an atom. OK? So it's, I'm not with that yeah. So you don't close. So basically, when you go into this equation, this is, the, this is related with the scattering length between bosons. And that, yeah, that factor combined with h bar and m basically sets two things. It sets the quantized vorticity in your system and the width of the, the radius of your vortices. So there is no need to close. You really solve that equation. OK? So this is a compressible flow. So the way energy is dissipated is at some point energy is dissipated into sound waves or phonons. Yes. So you don't have a viscosity. Uh, that's a huge problem, yeah. So some people define it basis, based on structure functions. There are many, many ways. You, some, so there is an experiment now in France that compares, for example, for non, uh, so superfluid helium with classical helium. And you get the same Kolmogorov spectrum. So from those kind of things, you can get some estimation of what the Reynolds number would be. But this, what is important from the point of view of people interested in geophysical turbulence is that the large scales of this flow mimic what we know about hydrodynamics in a lot of aspects. OK? Oh, <laughs> no, yeah, well, the, you know, the, com the the real part of that is actually something we use to create initial conditions for this system. Yeah. Yeah, that, this is a beautiful problem from the point of view of the physics. It's, it's unbelievable. So last example, or last two maybe, 
So we can do surface waves. So here we are not periodic, of course. So we can do things like quasi-geostrophic, surface waves, um, shallow water. And uh, the waves here look weird because the aspect ratio in the plot is, is just 4, 10 to the minus 3 compared with huge distances in the horizontal. But something we have done is to compare with experiments and to validate the solver with experiments. And the properties of the turbulence we get are, are very, very good, or are well reproduced by GHOST. So, uh, so now let's get a little bit more technical about GHOST. So I, I mentioned we do pseudospectral methods. So for people that don't know about pseudospectral, give me two minutes just to say in four words what the pseudospectral method is. So the idea is we need a method that is high order, and we like methods that are conservative and non-dispersive. So in pseudospectral, what you do is the following. You take any PD. Let's say you take Berger's equation, so one-dimensional PD, just like that. So you have time evolution, you have um, advection, and you have diffusion. So you project your field into some basis, Fourier basis. You replace there, and you get a set of ODs for the amplitude of each Fourier mode. Right? So then you have time evolution of the Fourier mode k equal to and differential operators in spectral space are very, very nice. For example, if you use Fourier, all differential operators become pro. So they are local from the point of view of the computation. So the Laplacian becomes just k square times your field. The problem are nonlinear terms. So nonlinear terms become convolution, right? Because you have the product of two Fourier expansions. Now, convolutions are n square from the point of view of the computational cost. So what two spectral methods do is, instead of computing the convolution, we compute the field in Fourier space, the derivative on the field in Fourier, in Fourier space, which is just a product. Then we Fourier transform both, and we do the product in real space. That, if you have a fast Fourier transform, gives you n log n operations in 1D. And in 3D, it's just the cube of that. So, uh, so that's basically so. We need what we need is a fast FFT, and Ghost uses either FFTW to compute serial FFTs or multi-threaded. Yes. Yeah. So, final difference is the er truncation error is of the order of one over delta x to the n. Right, where n is your order. In pseudospectral, the error is 1 over n to the n. So it's exponential conversions. OK? So typically, for example, if, if you take a 256 square, and this is rule of thumb, but you will find it in any book, uh, to get the error you, you get, the truncation error you get in a pseudospectral code 256 square, you need a 1,000 square with finite differences. And that increases exponentially as you increase the. So yeah. OK, so they converge rapidly, and they are very well behaved. So we use FFTW or CUDA FFT, uh, depending on the case. So let's go into, so basically what you buy, well, you don't buy. FFTW is free. but. What you get, and that's the only external library we have in Ghost, and that's one of the reasons it's very portable, so everything is self-contained, uh, it's some FFT library, let's say FFTW. So to get a parallel FFT, which is what you really need, the first thing you have to do is to divide your domain. And as I mentioned, we have a hierarchy on parallelizations, MPI, OpenMP, CUDA. So I will start with just MPI. You have your domain, any size, any number of grid points in each direction. You split your domains first in slabs. Right? So each MPI task, so each of your processors gets one slab. So task one works on this guy, and so on. 
We don't have any condition on the number of slabs, number of processors, number of MPI shops, or resolution. You can pick any number. Then there are some problems with load balancing, but we, we have ways to deal with that in Ghost. So now you have your, just to make it simpler, I will go to a cube, n cube. So n in each direction, it's the same if you have different resolutions in each direction. So each processor has a slab. Now you can do FFTs, serial FFTs, in two directions locally. And to do the remaining FFT, what you have to do is, it's a bad idea to do parallel FFTs, trying to share the information. So what you do is you transpose. So you have an array in real space, which have, let's say, it has slabs horizontally distributed in different processors. In Fourier space, so in your spectral space, you have vertical slabs. So after the transposition, this direction is locally in memory, and you can do the remaining FFT. Now, um, that's very good, but transpositions are all to all communication, right? To transpose, this guy has to send information to there, this has to send, and so on. So this is the worst communication pattern you can get. And for that reason, a lot of people 10 years ago said pseudo-spectral methods are dead. They won't scale to supercomputers. So there are some tricks you have to do, but they scale well. And I will try to convince you of that. Uh, but the thing is, yes, you have to do an all-to-all -all communication. So first thing first, let's say you're purely MPI. Right? So you are task zero, you have this. And what you want to have at the end is that guy there, you can just go to the MPI manual and you will find there is an all to all function. Bad idea. Okay? So don't do that. Uh, then you can just say, okay, let's just start non blocking communications, all of them, and I'm sure the hardware is very smart. Bad idea. So what we are doing now, and we have been doing this for the last eight years, and it's it's the best solution is to basically fire rounds of communications following this pattern. So in the first round, task 0 sends to task 1, 1 sends to 2, 2 sends to 3, and so, so on. All these goes at the same time, right? So we start the non-blocking send, non-blocking receive to the next guy. Then we start the same non-blocking sends and receives, but with a stride of 2. So 0 sends to 2, 1 sends to 3, and so on. And then we do the same with stride 3, and so on, until we end. So that's what the protocol computation Exactly. That's the same for communication. And it's the most efficient way to do it. We, you know, hardware has changed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's but the other thing. It's not just about the number of communications you have. It's also about the, um, you know, what is really important here, is that you don't clutter your entire network. If you start all communications, it's okay. Nah. So all to all is supposed to do that, but you know it depends a lot on each MPI implementation. Yeah, so whether uh, all to all is supposed to do this, but then you have each MPI library doing different things. So we actually do it by hand, and we actually allow the user to, we don't want the regular user to do this, but an advanced user could even tune the order in, with, in which these things are done. OK, so. Sorry, uh, does that require uh, power of 2? No. So this, this does not require power of 2. It can do anything. Actually, yeah, 1536 cube is like 3 times some power of 2. Yeah. So these are all results, but uh, they are useful to illustrate the pure MPI layer of the code. These are like 10 years old. so. You see, so this is speed up as a function of number of processors. That's time as a number of, of number of processors. And the plots are in log log. 
And the reason why I'm, I plot in log log is because time should, should decrease as 1 over the number of processors, and 1 over p in log log is a slope, is a straight line with slope minus 1. So the, stra the straight lines are ideal scale. And it, it's not bad. OK, so then, but the, this has, of course, it has a clear problem. The problem here is you, the number of processors you can use is limited to the number of slides you have in your domain. So for that, there are two solutions, one that we implemented and another one that uh, other groups implemented. So one thing you can do is, instead of separating your domain in slabs, you can do pencils. Right, so you do pencils like this in one of in e, in in each slab, and each pencil goes to a different MPI shop. That works very well; it scales very well. But when you look at the actual timings to do a time step, it's a slow because now each FFT requires two transpositions, and each transposition is an all-to-all -all communication, which is the worst you can get. So uh, you pay the price. So the other option, and that's what we have done, is to parallelize with shared memory on top. Right? And this was a bit when we started doing this, that the technology was really going into multi-cores. That's what happened. So, um, so you have your entire domain. Each slab is handled by one MPI task. And now you go into the MPI task, and you give to each thread a portion of your slab. Now, then you can do two things. You can do pencils, or you can do lasagnas. And the code decides at runtime what it will do. It can actually do different things in each node, so in each MPI task. So basically, what we decide is based on the load balancing and how much work each loop, each OpenMP loop gets we decide whether we decompose the domain like this or like that. Okay, so, And it's very simple. So basically, the loops look like this for people that are interested in the technical details. We have an op OpenMP pragma with an if, and we decide, depending on the how big the loop is, whether we will decompose the domain in one way or the other. So that. Uh, turned out to be actually very efficient. Then IO and MPI communications are only handled by the master thread, which is also very good because you basically aggregate all the communication, and then you send big packages instead of tiny chunks. So um, OK, so something that when you do these kind of things is very important is to be nice with the cache. So today, processors are basically based on cache. Right? You have a fast memory sitting very close to the processor, and you want to have all the information there. So um, for the transposition, that's not trivial, right? because the transposition, you are moving in one array in one direction, and the other array, you are moving in the opposite direction. There is no way out of there. And when you combine OpenMP, that can be a pain in the neck, because your threads can be in the same core, in the same socket or not. So, we, so for transpositions, we do something called cache blocking, which is basically do the transposition in small chunks that fit into the cache. That's trivial. You look in Google cache blocking, and you will find a lot of examples. But to combine that with OpenMP is not that trivial, so we also have some ifs to make this work. But the thing is, here you see the percentage of cache misses, not of one loop, not of one portion of the code, of the entire code. So this is the total number of cache misses when you're running Ghost in production. And with pure MPI, it's like 3%. Just to give an idea, 10% is considered reasonable. So 3% is very, very good. With OpenMP, it goes to 4% as long as all your threads are in the same socket. And even if you're out of socket, it goes to 10%, which is acceptable. But 
we can do a lot of trades, especially today, with 5% cash misses, which is very good from the point of view of the efficiency. We can reach efficiencies that are very, very large. So how does this scale? OK, so that's, again, number of cores, time, it's scales. But this is more interesting. So what you see here, the triangles is a pure MPI run, one thread, one over time. So this is basically speed up as a function of cores. The stars you see here are one MPI shove increasing number of threads. So a pure, the ghost running only in shared memory. Basically, no MPI parallelization, only open MP parallelization. And up to the number of cores in the socket, they are right on top. So basically, what, by increasing the number of, of threads in each socket, we gain the same in point in, from the point of view of efficiency as increasing the number of MPI shops. That's the best you can do. And actually, so this is this table is awful. It, it's not important. But what is important is this allows us to reach parallel efficiencies of 90% with, for example, 18,000 cores. So OK, so this is another example of scaling. So number of processors and time. So it should decrease as 1 over n. Here it's one over time, number of cores. This is 100,000 cores. And it scales, each case scales very well. So the message here, before I go into the GPUs just to finish this talk, is this hybrid implementation seems to be very versatile. So what we have found, and we published this in 2011, and so far in every supercomputer, it works. This gives just two knobs to the user, how many MPI shops per node, how many threads. And depending on the particular architecture you are working in, you can tune those numbers and get very, very good efficiency without going into weird stuff. Right? So there is not a lot of tuning except just picking how many threads and how many MPI shops. So, uh, so that's another advantage of this method is that it really has a hierarchy in which MPI handles the communication, does a lot of things. Then OpenMP comes. So this hierarchy is very natural to then add GPUs as a third layer of parallelization. So yes. Yeah. Oh, so uh, what's the rule of thumb? You choose the number of uh, you choose the number of uh, threads to run per MPI task. I think it's do you always keep it the same as a number of cores in one node? That's or? very good. So the rule of thumb is if it's if it's a small run, do you MPI first of all? If it's a big run, then set the larger number of MPI shops you can in each node, and then open the threads. That's a rule of thumb. Basically, because it's good for cache misses. So yeah, so basically, you shouldn't set more than one MPI, set less than one MPI shop per socket. And if you can set two because you have the memory, go with it. OK, I see. OK? Thanks. So uh, OK. So CPUs are complicated. And we all know that. So and let me tell you let me very, very quickly why. So these are times for running Ghost in the Vucinesque, so in the stratified case. Blue is total time. This is the time it takes to do the FFT with 32 cores. This is so on. So you see a large fraction of the time is spent computing FFTs. Then this is transposition, and this is communication. So 
this is the candidate to move into the CPUs. Right? If you can gain all this time, you can gain a very nice speed up. Why not move the entire code to the CPUs? Yes. Yes. That has to do with two things, the pattern we use for the communication and the fact that we aggregate data using the hybrid. Yeah. Because each node has smaller chunks as we increase the number of processors, but we, we keep big chunks, right? Because we aggregate everything to task zero. Yes. That's very good. That's something that allows us to scale. So um, yeah, that's a very good question. So OK, so CPUs. Uh, typical scaling for CFD applications, and this is according to NVIDIA, is 1.5 to 2.5. That's what you can expect. There are cases that get like six times speed ups, but are using very specific methods. So, um, so why CPUs are not that popular in CFD? Well, one reason is if you're doing turbulence, you need a lot of memory. And you don't have a lot of memory in the CPUs. Another reason is a lot of the computations that we do, like statistics, collective information, are not very fast in the CPUs. So what we have done is to do something hybrid in which what runs fast in the C CPU goes to the CPU. What runs fast in the CPU remains in the CPU. So. Um, OK, so let's skip this and let's go into an example. So something very important is GPUs are very fast, but the time it takes to copy data to the GPU is large. So the way we solve that problem is that creating multiple streams and copying small chunks of the data to the GPU. Then we start the FFT as soon as we have enough data. And we keep copying chunks. So this is from the host to the device. Then we start the FFT, we keep copying, and we get the data back. Right? So that basically masks the huge amount of time it takes to copy data into the device. So here you have an example. And this is not the best one I will show you. This is without CPUs. So these are two examples. These are all examples using 16 cores all the 16 cores to CPUs. So this is, and this is for the entire code, not just the accelerated component. So time to compute, and total time, time to the FFT. You go to the CPUs, the time to the FFT becomes zero. It's not zero, it's like 10 to the minus two, but it's zero, right? So, and that's great. And then you say, whoa, that's very nice. The code should be B is faster. And that's not what happens. And the reason is because this guy appears, which is the time it takes to do the copies. So we mask this by doing two streams, four streams. And as you see, as you increase the number of streams, this time decreases. But the time to do the FFTs in the CPU increase, because now we have less data in each stream. So there is an optimal value which for this case is eight streams. That's the fastest. Yes. That means you missed, uh, you just break down them to a specific time. So you use the copy time to do the FFT. Is that what you mean? So yes. So basically, you have the task zero that has the entire uh, chunk of data. And you divide that chunk in smaller chunks. And you do the mem copy with the first small chunk. Then you start the FFT, and you keep copying in different streams. So you parallelize inside the CPU. In that way, you mask the time. The time it takes to move the data is the same, but it, it's masked because it, it combines with the time to compute the FFTs. Yes. Thank you. So here you see typical speed ups for the entire code in production mode. So 1.7 for Hydro, 1.7 for MHD, two times the speed up for, quantum, for the quantum solver, 1.9 for Stratify. So two times the speed up, we say, OK, that's not bad. And uh, so that's basically what happens. So you have total time, 
the FFT disappears, but instead of gaining all these, you get you gain that because of this guy, right? Because of the time it takes to to copy the data. But communication remains the same, transposition, so all the rest is unaffected, and that's very, very good. So just to finish, let me show you two more examples of scaling. So this is scaling with hybrid, and this is scaling with hybrid and CUDA different solvers. They scale linearly, all as expected. The largest run we have right now with GPUs is the 4,000 cube I showed you. 100,000 cores, 6,200 GPUs. And the speed up in that case was 1.7. But this was done two years ago in a previous version of the code that was using only one stream. So from this data, I assume today this RAM could have a speed up of a factor of two. And uh, this is just a final comparison. So this is with hybrid. This is hybrid plus CUDA. And it scales. Actually, there is some super scaling, probably because the PCI port gets alleviated. But the thing is, there is a factor of two here, same here. And they, all, all the versions of the code scale very, very well. OK, so that's my last one. And I will leave the conclusions. It's just a short version of all I said. OK, so thank you very much. Thank you.